Shannon O'Grady, welcome to the Free Trail Podcast. Nice to see you. Thanks so much, Dylan. It's nice to see you too. I've wanted to do this for such a long time. You are, of course, the chief product officer, the chief operating officer at Gnarly Nutrition, who has been a great supporter of ours here at Free Trail. So a big thank you from Free Trail and all the Free Trail listeners out there. Um, we had a one-on-one call just a, I mean, it's several months ago at this point, but I was so impressed and just like left that Zoom meeting with more nutritional education that I could uh, possibly absorb in one meeting. And uh, of course, I've forgotten all of it at this point. So now we're we're recording it and memorializing it so that I can learn and the audience can learn and that we can all go back and, uh, you know, listen again when we forget the details. But thanks for being here. Really excited to have you. I think the best place to start is just a quick bit of personal background as a way of introducing yourself to the audience. Sure. Um, first off, we at Gnarly are so excited about the free trail partnership and we've loved working with you. So thanks, you know, extending thanks to you guys as well. Um, I have always been a runner. I started, I, I can remember doing my first running race at six years old. My, my older sister trained me for it and, uh, um, ran cross country and track in high school. Absolutely loved it. Um, kind of moved to running marathons and, and longer distance in graduate school, which was about the time that I was working on my thesis. So, um, my graduate degree is more in kind of the science of nutrition and nutritional physiology. So how kind of the interplay between our bodies and the food we take in and, and what happens there. Um, so not necessarily a nutritionist or a dietitian in the, in the classical sense, but just kind of as, you know, Eli and, and, uh, and the other gnarly employees call me like chief nerd officer is probably the most like apropos term. Mm -hmm. Um, and at gnarly, I get to work with athletes. I get to work with, um, different partners, talk about nutrition, educate about nutrition. I'm also in charge of all product formulations, product quality, product manufacturing. So um, I get to wear a lot of hats and it's it's been a blast working there. Mm -hmm. And you have a PhD, right? I do, yeah. That, that usually indicates that you've contributed to the body of human knowledge in some way. Do you want to speak about that a little bit? What was your contribution? Yeah, sure. So I've I've published papers in a in a wide range of subjects. Um everything from kind of the morphological adaptations we see in the gut of animals that eat plants versus uh animal matter. Um I've done work using stable isotopes to look at how diet and nutrition and even exercise can affect water metabolism in humans. Um, I've done epigenetic work looking at how um, different factors can contribute to how uh, fetuses process nutrients um, factors as much as, you know, uh, including the the women of the mother's health and the mother's diet. So a little bit like all over the place, but nutrition being really the baseline um, of, of all the different research projects I've worked on. Wow. Super fun. So I've got a laundry list of fun nutrition questions to get to, but before we do that, I'd love for you to just speak about Gnarly quickly, because of course it's been a, a, a brand that the audience has heard me talk about a million times, but maybe you could add, add a personal element to it. If you want to talk about maybe how you were introduced to the brand and what makes it a special place to work. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I found the, the Gnarly through, um, a friend of mine that was actually one of the very first gnarly sponsored athletes, backcountry skier, uh, Noah Howell is his name. And I remember him posting about it and being like, being kind of confused by the name, like, well, that, that's kind of not what I would consume or consider the <laughs> ideal name for a nutrition company, but it stuck with me, which says, you know, something in and of itself. And I think it's um, a great brand. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think brand names that stick in your head, that, mm -hmm. that is the mark of a good brand. Um, but I looked at the products, I looked uh, at the formulations and they really resonated with my own kind of nutritional principles and, and morals for lack of a better, better word. And, um, so I wrote gnarly, uh, at the time, like just the company, but it was really to Eli, the CEO, um, a letter and sent him my resume and, and basically outlined what I thought I could do for the company. And about seven years ago, 
he read that email, took a chance on me, and we we started just kind of working on a contractual level. And then I came on board and headed up product development and manufacturing, and, and that kind of evolved to, to where we are now. Great. Well, thank you again for all the support that you've shown to us, and it's great to have you here on the podcast. So now let's dive into the meat of our conversation. I have so many things that I want to learn from you, and I'm sure the audience will be very excited to sort of listen along. But I want to start first with electrolytes, which is a subject or a thing that I am interested in personally. I really like enjoy electrolyte, like the gnarly hydrate mix. And just like, I find myself feeling better when I do supplement with electrolytes. And I think that there's some people out there who maybe feel that uh, electrolytes are, maybe it's a misunderstood field in the nutrition world. So maybe I'll just open it up with just like a quick background of what do electrolytes actually do in our body and what makes them applicable in sport performance? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a great question because I do think that they're misunderstood. And I think a lot of that relates to their association um, with cramping Mm -hmm. and with this idea that, uh, you know, having low electrolyte levels is really um, the genesis of a lot of the the cramping that we we can feel during uh, running and and especially during um, high intensity exercise. And I think more recently, we found that um, while electrolyte um, levels in your body can contribute to cramping, they're often not the sole reason why we experience cramping. Um, so electrolytes are simply their their minerals um, that are in our bodily fluids, and they carry an electric charge. So um, probably the most common one that we hear about, and and in some ways the most important, is sodium, and that's because when we sweat the electrolyte that we lose in the greatest amount is sodium. So it's Mm -hmm. extremely important that, um, that we replace sodium, not necessarily because having low levels will lead to high levels of cramping, but because the amount of electrolytes we have in our body really regulate um, how water is uh, transported throughout our body and the amount of water we hold on to in our body. Mm-hmm. It can affect things like pH and and um, electrolyte balance definitely affects muscle function. So while there is a connection between electrolyte levels and sport performance, it's not necessarily that direct connection that for so long we were led to believe um, to cramping. Yeah. Is there a difference between taking electrolytes in pill form versus using a drink mix? Not necessarily. The only thing that I try to caution with taking anything in pill form is we have to be cognizant of how much we're taking at once and whether or not we're following it up with uh, water to dilute it. Because anytime your body sees something in like a bolus, like a concentrated a ball or amount, um, it can affect how water is transported in and out of your gut. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of an anecdotal story. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, in another life used to, used to do like Iron Man and half Iron Man and a good friend of mine, uh, who was notorious for making every nutrition mistake you could ever think of, uh, during a race realized that he had not been taking electrolytes. It, it was getting very hot. He was on the bike and he decided to, you know, they have those, um, concentrated electrolyte drops yep. and he decided to just go ahead and shoot a bunch of that. Well, That would be an example of taking too Too many electrolytes all at once. And basically your body then looks at that concentrated amount of electrolytes in your gut and is like, oh, well, I need to shunt water into the gastrointestinal tract in order to dilute um, the electrolytes that are in there. And so one, you're dehydrating yourself. Two, with all of this fluid passing in your gastrointestinal tract, it's going to go one of two ways, you know, up. You're going to yep. be throwing up or out. You're going to be in, you know, the porta potty. And that's exactly what happened to him. And he ended up getting horribly just dehydrated, needed, you know, an IV. Um, so almost doing the exact opposite of what so the, the body is sort of pulling 
water away from the working muscles into the gut, therefore dehydrating your muscles and exactly. putting you in a dangerous position. How do you go about, because obviously there's consequences to taking too much. There's also consequences to not having enough. How do you advise people to figure out what the right dosage of electrolytes is? Yeah, great question. So there's a huge amount of variation around uh, the average amount of electrolytes or sodium specifically lost in a pound of sweat. So it can be in a pound of sweat is about 16 ounces. So it can be anywhere from, I think the low end is about 200 milligrams to, for some people, they might lose up to 1100 milligrams. Um, I know I'm a salty sweater and that I'm, I always have the, you know, dried white marks on hats and sweatbands and things that I'll wear. Um, and so where you fall in that range can depend on genetics. It can depend on the amount of salt in your diet, because of course, the more salt you consume in your diet, the more salt that you're going to lose. Um, it can depend on, uh, you know, environmental factors like temperature and humidity. It can depend on how acclimatized you are to the conditions that you're racing in. Um, and so it can change a lot. Um, they now have these uh, kind of skin measures of sodium content of sweat. And there is a bit of variation um, around the results that those can give, but I feel like it gives you a ballpark idea, mm -hmm. you know, for those that might not be able to, you know, access something like that. Um, you know, I usually recommend that people start in the range of 300 to 500 milligrams of sodium per hour, and that can get you kind of a good baseline. And then you can play with it from there and, and see how you feel. Yeah. Okay, great. So let's move on. Let's talk about caffeine. What are the considerations runners should keep in mind when thinking about their fueling products and caffeine, I guess, specifically before and during exercise? Sure. Um, you know, I think ca caffeine can be useful in a number of ways. Beforehand, it can be useful, you know, simply for, for waking us up. A lot of us have coffee or tea in the morning. It can also be useful for clearing the bowel ahead of a race, which is always a nice thing to get out of the way so you don't have to worry about it when you're running. Um, I think for a long time, people thought that caffeine um, was dehydrating. For some reason, I can't remember that word, the word for it, something that... Uh, dehydrates you spacing it but essentially would diuretic diuretic thank you look that's at it. me look, look at, at me. you yeah. <laughs> um but that's actually uh m more recently been shown not to be true where they've looked at um you know the consumption of caffeine versus other fluids and then looked at the amount of fluid loss so for those of you that may not be up and up on you know <laughs> caffeinate ca studies on caffeine caffeine is in fact not a diuretic so you don't have to worry about about that as a negative um during exercise there's some research showing that caffeine helps our rate of perceived exertion which i think is a funny term but it's basically like how hard you think you're working mm -hmm. so um potentially if you think you're you're you know not working as hard fatigue is kind of farther you know farther away and and um that can help with endurance efforts um but i think the one thing that we need to to be aware of is that taking caffeine in on a regular basis can blunt that effect. Mm -hmm. um, and so being aware of how you use caffeine ahead of a race and whether or not you are really relying on that benefit um, should maybe inform a little bit of how much you consume up to that point. Of course, we also want to always look at um, the interplay of caffeine and sleep quality. Um, I've really been impressed with the amount of research and positive messaging coming out about how important it is for athletes to get a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. um, and if we're having caffeine too late in the day, often that can impact that sleep. And it's so important for recovery and for then getting the most out of your training. So I think also being aware of how your caffeine consumption might be negatively impacting sleep onset and sleep quality is really also an important consideration. Amazing. So it's almost like caffeine is as much a psychological aid as it is a physical aid, if not more so, it sounds like. Yeah, I would agree with that. Amino acids. This is another thing that I'm fascinated about. One of my favorite gnarly products is the BCAA drink mix. I have it every single morning. And I like in the occasional moment where I am traveling and don't have it or whatever, I feel at least like a subjective, maybe a placebo feeling of, you know, not having that extra kick. What is an amino acid? 
Sure. So um, all amino acids have kind of the same basic structure. It's a it's a nitrogen compa- containing compound. And then each amino acid has kind of a little different side chain that determines how it interacts with other molecules. So protein um, has a number of complex structures, but the primary structure we can think of is just like this, you can almost think of a, a um a chain of pearls with each pearl being an amino acid. So different proteins contain different assortments of amino acids um, and also different quantities of those amino acids. Um, Amino acids are divided into two major groups, essential and non-essential amino acids. And the, the way I like to remember the difference between those is that it's essential that we get essential amino acids from our diet because we can't synthesize them. Okay. Um, so non-essential amino acids, we can synthesize from other amino acids. And so while they're still important, it's not as important that we pay attention to the sources in our diet if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so there's a subgroup of essential amino acids called the branch chain amino acids. And that little side group that I was talking about as far as like the chemical structure um, is actually a branch. It's mm-hmm. like a, almost like a tree branch. And that's how, how, you know, the reason why they were given their name. So those three amino acids are leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And What studies have shown is that leucine in particular is really important for turning on the mechanism um, associated with muscle protein synthesis. Um, So it's almost like the light switch that turns on that um, that process. What's important to note is that not it's not BCAAs alone that are. can really build muscle, you need all of the essential amino acids. Mm. And this really, I think, informs how gnarly recommends taking branch chain amino acids. We never recommend replacing protein in your diet with branch chain amino acids. Um, And really, you should be following up your exercise with whole protein that contains branch chain amino acids. And therefore, you get the thing turning on the light switch, as well as the electricity that actually is making the light glow. Where we recommend adding BCAAs, if you fall into a group that may need them, and I'll get to that in a moment, is before training. And that's because um, having BCAAs in your system while you're exercising has been um, connected to uh, lower levels of DOMS or delayed onset muscle soreness. And so they help with recovery. There's also some more kind of theoretical benefits of branched chain amino acids, and that's related kind of similar to caffeine to kind of perceived exertion or, Mm. or fatigue. Um, and so the BCAAs can can competitively, uh, uh, inhibit the absorption of tryptophan, which is another, uh, amino acid. You know, everybody is like, Oh, you're, you know, post Thanksgiving, all that turkey is going to make you tired. (laughs) Yeah. And it's because Turkey is high is high in tryptophan and that's where, um, that idea comes from tryptophan's converted to serotonin in your brain, which can make you kind of sleepy. So when the BCAAs kind of competitively um, inhibit tryptophan absorption, they decrease the likelihood of that of that happening. Mm-hmm. Um, that's hard to test. I haven't really seen any like concrete research showing that. Um, so yeah, I put it kind of more in the theoretical may help you class. Um, it's interesting because BCAAs are kind of one of those controversial supplements. A lot of people will be like, you don't need them. Like it's a waste of your money. Yep. And part of that may be true. It really depends upon uh, your protein intake. If you are getting the amount of protein in your diet that you need to support um, the level of exercise and training that you're doing. And for some people, you know, even people that are pretty <laughs> pay attention to, you know, pretty on it with their nutrition, they they still have trouble getting protein in on a regular basis. Um, and when I say regular basis, I'm talking about like every three to four hours. So pretty yeah. consistently over the course of the day. Um, that's where BCAAs can be helpful. It can be helpful if you're training first thing in the morning. So you haven't had a protein rich meal in the last two to three hours. Um, and the reason why that's important is because if you did have a protein rich meal, then you'd have the BCAAs 
you know, in your body from that protein. Um, it can be important if you're a plant-based athlete, you know, I think plant-based athletes can be hugely successful and there are a lot of good things about being plant-based, but if you look at protein quality for most plant-based proteins, um, it's a little lower because of, uh, lower levels of um, digestive efficiency of, of plant-based protein for lower levels of essential amino acids and lower levels of leucine. You can often combat that by simply eating more plant-based protein. But once mm -hmm. again, if you have trouble getting in protein, that's not a help for you. So yeah. that's where BCAAs can be helpful. And then the, the last class that I kind of recommend considering adding BCAAs in are, you know, those that are my age. So, you know, in their forties, mm -hmm. um, and older where it gets hard. Um, it, it takes more protein to kind of turn on the same muscle protein synthesis, uh, levels as, uh, when we were younger, you know, lesser amounts of protein, um, were required to turn it on. That didn't come out so clear, but you know what I mean? Yep. Um, and so you need even more protein as you age, um, and I think the numbers that I've seen around that is like, whereas 25 grams of protein and the associated amount of amino acids would have turned on that metabolic pathway when you're in your twenties, it's more like 40 to 45 grams of protein once you get in your forties. So, um, as we age, it's even more important to take in additional amounts of protein because one, it takes more protein to turn on the same muscle protein synthesis um, pathways that are responsible for maintaining muscle, building new muscle, repairing muscle. Um, and number two, protein and muscle mass or muscle mass specifically is critical for keeping us moving, keeping us active. That can be related to our bone health, can decrease the likelihood of fracture, all of these things that um, can have a significant impact on uh, quality of life as we age. So I, I also really recommend that um, older Athletes and even older people in general, if you have trouble getting in protein consistently, BCAAs are super light on the stomach. They're easy to take in. And there's research showing that they can help make up for suboptimal uh, protein intake. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. So in the fuel to a drink mix, which is sort of like my go-to main calorie source during racing and training. There's an ingredient called HMB, which on our first call you explained is like an amino acid, but different. Can you explain that? Yeah. So the real name for HMB is a mouthful. It's called hydroxymethylbutyrate. Um, and in metabolic pathways, you know, it's almost like one thing's impacted by an enzyme. It gets changed to another thing. And th the word for that other thing can, can be a metabolite. So it's kind of like um, a step on on the way to uh the the process um that you know we're we're talking about which in this case is muscle protein synthesis um and so leucine for a long time people um would say that there's a limit to the the amount um or to the impact that leucine can have or a limit to the amount uh to the positive um benefit that amount of protein can have so um, they might say, well, if you consume any, any more than 30 grams of protein, it's not really doing anything for you. Or for a long time, people thought you weren't absorbing it when in fact you do absorb that protein, but there is a ceiling to the benefit that protein can have specific mm -hmm. to muscle protein synthesis. And that, um, ceiling is due to, uh, the benefit that leucine, the branch chain amino acid can have. There's almost like a bottleneck. Um, you can think of it as, as like a chemical bottleneck. Um, well, the great thing is that this metabolite HMB is actually past that bottleneck. Um, and so HMB can actually have a greater impact um, than leucine on preventing muscle protein breakdown. And research has shown um, that that is where you find the benefit of HMB, preventing muscle protein breakdown, as opposed to necessarily stimulating muscle protein synthesis. So that's why we have HMB in Fuel 2.0, because for endurance athletes, right, you can almost think of an endurance event as this constant state of mm -hmm. caloric deficit. You can never take in as many calories as you're burning. Mm -hmm. And with nutrition, 
that we're using to fuel endurance events, we're constantly fighting that battle, right? We're trying to close the gap between the amount of fuel that we're burning and the amount of fuel that we're able to take in. And because of that, you see muscles being slowly broken down um, and that can lead to kind of poor recovery, potentially impacts on performance, can impact how you feel after the race. So introducing something to your you know, in-race nutrition that might minimize or slightly decrease that amount of muscle protein breakdown is going to help with recovery later on. And they actually use HMB in hospitals, um, in AIDS patients, or in patients where you see significant amounts of muscle protein breakdown because of the disease state. And they've seen a huge improvement in that when, um, you know, HMB is, is introduced in the diet. Incredible. This is such a dense episode. Creatine. Give us the 101. <laughs> this is one of my favorite, favorite topics. I think everyone should be on creatine. Um, for a long time, creatine was associated with bodybuilding, with like huge That's muscles. what I was going to say. Like, yeah. dudes on the, on the football team at my high school took creatine. That's all I know about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think your 80-year-old grandmother should be on creatine, okay. to be yeah. honest. Um, so... I always like to talk about the way creatine works because I think sometimes the misunderstanding people see, you know, have that association with like the high school football players or bodybuilders. And they think that it's some kind of hormone, which creatine is not a hormone. Um, it's, it, it is something we get out of our diets. If we consume animal matter, it's stored in muscles. Um, it's stored in muscles as creatine phosphate, which is basically the creatine molecule with a high energy, with a high energy bond and a phosphate molecule connected to it. Um, and so when we, if we're an omnivore, so we consume meat, um, we get kind of about our creatine stores about 60% full, uh, based on our, on our diet and creatine that we just make from amino acids. Um, if you're a vegetarian or vegan, uh, those, natural creatine levels are going to be somewhat lower. Um, so where supplementation is helpful is that by supplementing with extra creatine, we can actually take those stores from, let's say, like 40 to 60 percent, depending on your diet, to 100 percent. And creatine is useful because it's a really fast way to generate ATP, which is the main energetic currency of the body. So we produce ATP through different energetic systems, through aerobic metabolism, through anaerobic metabolism, and through the creatine phosphagen pathway. And so um, when uh, basically how that occurs is creatine donates that phosphate that I said was attached to it to adenosine diphosphate, which only has two phosphates. And so it takes that extra phosphate and then you have adenosine triphosphate. And that adenosine triphosphate can break off that extra phosphate and release energy. And that's how kind of we do work. Muscular work is done is through that energy release. Um, and so when we're at that 60% so store just from making creatine on our own or for getting creatine in our diet, um, the amount of, of energy or ATP that we can make via the creatine phosphagen pathway lasts about five to eight seconds. So it's pretty quick. And that's why it's also always associated with like strength-based movements that are, are in pretty short duration. When we supplement with creatine and we take those stores to full or to 100%, you see an increase from that like five to eight second window to eight to 12 seconds, which translates to an increase in power or strength of about 15 to 20%. And this has been measured in a range of different sports in sprinting in like maximal lifts in um, maxim, maximal reps for a given amount of weight. And so in power and strength, um, uh, activities or based activities, it can make a huge difference. But, and here's the big thing, is that more and more research is, is showing that that's not the only benefit of creatine. So similar to glycogen, creatine stored with water, um, which is why for a long time people, you know, thought, you know, the weight gain that you experience from creatine is a negative. But as endurance athletes, being in a hyperhydrated state can actually be a benefit. So mm -hmm. that's something to consider. Um, hydration can 
uh, also help protect our tendons and ligaments, can make sure uh, you know, that they're functioning correct, correctly. So it's really good for musculoskeletal tissue. And that may be why there's not an exact mechanism uh, that's talked about in these papers I've read, but um, they've done a number of studies showing that on, in, on major league football teams, um, on professional bas- I don't know if major league football teams, professional football teams, professional basketball teams, college level basketball, and I think college level soccer, um, when they look at athletes that supplement with creatine versus those that don't, athletes on creatine get injured less. Wow. You know, so it could be due to that hyperhydration. Um, there's research looking at uh, creatine as a, a possible intermuscular buffer. So when, um, you know, for a long time, people would be like, oh, the lactic acid, right? Well, it's not actually lactic acid, lactate and hydrogen are two separate things. But when we use anaerobic metabolism to produce ATP as a byproduct, we produce hydrogen ions. And we do see an increase in acidity. And many of us feel that increase in acidity. So a buffer is something that simply slows down that rise in acidity. Mm -hmm. And it's that rise in acidity that eventually leads to muscular failure. And so by slowing down that increase in, in acidity, we can also positively benefit endurance. So there could be a positive impact there. Um, and then there's also research showing that creatine um, can be really important for neural protection. Um, so, and there's research showing that creatine can actually help with depression. So they've done studies um, looking at uh, individuals on antidepressants, um, and I'm not suggesting anybody should ever come off their antidepressants, but in these studies, they saw that um, there was actually uh, less of a need um, for as many or as much of an antidepressant dose um, when individuals that were on those drugs also took creatine. So lots of interesting research in lots wow. of different places. Um, and then I think kind of as a baseline for all of that, it's probably one of the best studied supplements out there and really has no negative um, long-term impacts as far as uh, supplementation goes. Um, wow. So it's really safe. Um, it's really well studied and it can have a range of, of benefits. Um, we were talking about why amino acids and protein might be so important for aging athletes. I would put creatine up there as well. Anything that's going to help you maintain or possibly put on more muscle is a really important consideration as we get older. Yeah. Wow. Incredible. That is probably the most uh, underrated supplement on planet earth at this point, physical, psychological, even potentially emotional benefits. Thanks so much for that. Let's talk about recovery a little bit. Is there actually a recovery window after exercise? And if so, how long and how would you advise trail runners to take advantage of it? Yeah. Um, great question. So I think get in food as soon as you can. Um, but never think it's too late to consume, you know, a meal. The research shows that there's somewhat of a diminishing return as far as glycogen replenishment, the longer we, we wait to take in carbohydrates post-exercise, but taking in something is going to be always going to be better than nothing. Um, so I like to think about it in order of like rehydration, carbohydrates, protein. If you can get all three of those things, excellent. When we're looking at, uh, you know, glycogen depleting exercise using the three to one or four to one ratio of carbs to protein, I think is a really good way to go. Um, I like that protein um, dosage or, or intake to be at least 20 to 25 grams. And that's because when we consume that much protein, I'd say for plant-based protein, maybe closer to 30 grams. When we consume that much protein, we're getting enough branch chain amino acids and essential amino acids to really get muscle protein synthesis where it should be. You know, so if we're getting 25 grams of protein, then we should be looking for like 75 grams or 100 grams of carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. Um, and then another important thing to remember is that if your exercise was totally glycogen depleting, making sure you're getting carbohydrates consistently for the four to six hours after, uh, you're done exercising is really important. So it's not just that recovery meal one and done, but it's making sure you're getting in carbohydrates 
um, every hour. And, um, and I would say hydration as well to make, making sure you're, you're efficiently rehydrating. Mm -hmm. And most brands offer both a way nutri or way recovery option versus a vegan recovery option. Can you explain maybe the pros and cons of each? Yeah, if sure. Any? Um, so whey protein is kind of the gold, gold standard for proteins. And that's because, um, it has really high digestive. That was really hard to say. It has really high digestive efficiency, um, which means that when we take in the protein, we actually absorb the most of the amino acids that are in that protein. Um, plant proteins, as we talked about earlier, have lower digestive efficiency, and that's often due to the high fiber content of um, the plant that you're getting that protein from. So if you're you're looking at a plant protein powder you know, often that fiber has been removed. So you're going to have higher like digestion. Like a pea protein, for yeah. example. Yeah. yeah, pea protein and soy protein, which we can we can talk a little bit about the negative connotation of soy. I'm a big fan of soy protein. Um, but I think for a long time, you know, it got a bad name. Um, but both pea protein and soy protein powders are great options for plant-based athletes. So those are going to have higher digestive efficiency um, then if you are getting that protein from whole foods that might have a higher fiber content and therefore affect, um, how you digest it, mm -hmm. um, whey proteins also high in essential amino acids, um, and it's really high in leucine. So dairy proteins have, um, higher levels of essential amino acids and branch chain amino acids than even, uh, you know, meat or, or fish. Um, so getting in a dairy protein, whether it be from like cottage cheese or yogurt, um, or even a glass of milk, um, or a whey based protein powder is a great option as, um, a post-workout, you know, recovery, um, meal or, or, or shake. Mm -hmm. I would say plant protein can be great as well. We just talked about how plant-based protein powders are a good option, um, because of lower levels of essential amino acids relative to whey and lower levels of branch chain amino acids, that's where that recommendations recommendation for having just a little bit more protein to make up um, for those lower uh, levels of those amino acids comes. Um, and I would recommend looking for something that's pea-based or soy-based. Often in protein powders, you'll find a mix of um, different proteins that will both help with the amino acid profile of the protein powder, but will also help with the texture um, mm -hmm. and make it just more palatable. While we're on the subject of protein, it makes me remember that we were talking about collagen last time we talked, and it was something that you also recommended as being something that could be very helpful for athletes, in particular, maybe aging athletes, I think is what you said. But you also mentioned that it's like not really a protein in the same way that maybe some people think of it. Can you provide that clarification on collagen? Dylan, you listened. I listened. I just didn't <laughs> absorb. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, yeah. So great, great question. Um, I never, I do recommend collagen protein. Um, there's good research showing that, um, in biomechanical models, collagen supplementation can help um, stimulate collagen synthesis. Um, that's pretty hard to test in, in humans. And I think, uh, more and more research is coming out. So hopefully we'll see, you know, something that, that helps solidify that benefit. Um, but that can be important for athletes that participate in activities that are load bearing, which running, I would, I would consider, you know, for our, our lower joints, um, that to, to kind of fall into that classification, uh, it can also be important for recovering potentially from an injury. So if you already hurt your knee, um, could be something to consider. Uh, in about your mid to late 30s, you see a decline in natural collagen production. So that's where the recommendation for aging athletes come in. Um, but I think above and beyond potentially stimulating collagen synthesis, the research that's more convincing to me is that they've done studies in osteoarthritic patients, um, rating the pain they feel from those arthritic joints and collagen supplementation has a significant impact on that pain. And then also in um, 
athletes with non-arthritic joint pain, um, you see a significant improvement in pain from um, injured joints. So there's no ne- there's no mechanism attached to that. But you have to think that it might be connected to some kind of healing mechanism that had to do with collagen production. I personally have benefited from that. I have a weird arthritic toe from a here's my cat um, from an old injury. Uh, you know, af- after track practice, jumping off the back of a bus in my track flats, which was not smart. I broke my toe, and it's you know forever since been arthritic and painful and collagen supplementation makes a huge impact on that for me. Really? I um, have the exact same thing in my left big toe. So yeah, it's, know. it's my left, like second, second toe. Yep. Um, and now it's all kind of like hobbled over, yeah. but, uh, enough about toes. Um, <laughs> what you, what you brought up about when to take collagen, I think is the most important thing because as we discussed, like high quality proteins for recovery have to be in high and essential amino acids. It's really good for them to be high in branch chain amino acids, particularly leucine. Um, but collagen is neither, right? It, it has pretty low levels of essential amino acids and it has pretty low levels of leucine. So we never want to replace high quality proteins in our diet with collagen. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also really important to take collagen as opposed to post-exercise, if you can to take it in the hour before you exercise. And that's because there's nothing necessarily telling the collagen to go to our toe joints or to somebody's knee joint or potentially your shoulder. Um, So if you're doing exercise, that's going to increase blood flow to that particular joint, or maybe you're injured and you're doing rehab that really focuses on an injured joint, Once you have that hour to digest the collagen and break it down into constituent amino acids or, you know, or groups of amino acids called peptides, um, that increased blood flow to that area is going to help bring those amino acids and peptides to that area. Wow. So like, could you put it in your coffee before a workout in the morning? Yeah, you could. Um, Specific to gnarly collagen, uh, we do have vitamin C in it. So vitamin C is... Um, another compound that has been shown to help with the mechanical properties of collagen. So the strength of collagen and vitamin C is very temperature dependent. Okay. Um, so putting it in your coffee could some, some, somewhat degrade that vitamin C and it, you might, it might not be as effective, but the heat. But you would, could just put it in a glass of water. You could put it. Yeah. It makes sure it, collagen, most collagen powders are unflavored or even if they're flavored yeah. kind of have a wonky taste. So, um, I would recommend sticking in some juice or maybe adding it to, to something that has a little bit more flavor. Okay. At the risk of touching a third rail, can you give your opinion on fasting, intermittent fasting, and its advantages or disadvantages for health and performance? Sure. Um, I'm not a huge fan of intermittent fasting just because I think, um, you know, there's a, there's a time and place for fuel and it's usually kind of around exercise. Um, I think there, you know, it can kind of be a contentious subject of doing fasted fasted runs to help maybe with fat adaptation. Um, and I, and I think that there is some research supporting that that could be helpful. So it would not be any kind of performance gain whatsoever. And 100%, it has to be really low intensity. So we're talking about zone one, zone two, um, your, below your aerobic threshold. So not anaerobic threshold, you're below your aerobic threshold. So your body is primarily burning fat. Um, and so for some athletes that might be helpful because it can impact how much fat you burn during races that can impact potentially how many carbohydrates you have to take in and whether or not, um, you're going to run into the risk of gut distress, simplifying our nutrition can always be great for that. Um, but I think that has to be done in a very controlled fashion. We have to be aware of our intensity and make sure that, for the, we're not in a caloric deficit because of that fasted run, that our body is getting the total amount of calories that you need over the course of the day. And so we're making up for that by eating and fueling our body later in the day. Um, so I wanted to throw that out there. But um, as far as kind of eating in a specific window, um, I think you just have to be really careful about where your exercise falls in that window, the kind of exercise you're doing, and just making sure you're giving your body the fuel you need to perform and also recover. Amazing. Thank you for that. 
supplementation. Um, I, I would love to hear your personal philosophy on like vitamins and minerals and taking them in sort of pill form. I know gnarly offers at least like vitamin D and iron. Can you provide, uh, your opinion as to when runners should consider thinking about adding those types of supplements, like maybe use those as an example, D and iron. Yeah, sure. Um, I think like most things, every person is different. And so you need to kind of take a step back and look at your lifestyle and your diet. And that's going to really inform whether or not you'd need to supplement with vitamins and minerals. Vitamin D can be an important one for most people just because we spend most of the day inside. Um, And so we're really not outdoors exercising and exposing our skin to the sunlight when um, the rays being produced by the sun are the ones that are going to cause vitamin D production in, in our skin. On top of that, um, you know, sunscreen and protecting our skin from, from cancer is really important as well. And so whether you're wearing extra clothes for that, or you're applying sunscreen, that's also going to impact vitamin D, uh, production, um, skin pigmentation can also affect vitamin D, um, production. So given all these things, and when we look at kind of the population of the U S we actually see that 60 to 70% of the, of the population is deficient in vitamin D. So um, I think moderate supplementation to prevent deficiency um, can be really important. Uh, For me, moderate supplementation might during the summer be a thousand international units or IUs of vitamin D, potentially upping that to 2000 IUs during the winter, depending on your lifestyle. And if you're one of those people that gets out on bluebird days and skis or runs in winter, then might not need it. Um, But remember again, if it's cold, we have clothes over our body. So it's only our face that's exposed. Um, I do sometimes get a little angry when I see, you know, um, supplements that have extreme levels of vitamin D, uh, you know, 5,000, 10,000, even, you know, 20,000 I use most research shows that that's not necessary Mm -hmm. unless you have, um, a clinical diagnosis of vitamin D deficiency, and then you might need that much vitamin D to pull you out of deficiency. Um, but vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin, so we don't excrete it and it's stored in our fat. I don't think there's been enough research showing, um, what chronic intake of high levels of vitamin D, um, what damage it could possibly be doing. So I'd stick with vitamin C, which is water soluble and therefore you can't really take too much. Right. Totally similar with the B vitamins. Um, I think iron's also an important one to consider. Um, whenever I think of iron, I think of kind of this Venn diagram of uh, who might need to replace it. Um, so females uh, of menstruating age, particularly important. Um, runners um, or endurance athletes because of kind of the striking and the breakdown of, of blood cells that can occur. Um, and then uh, vegetarians and vegans that might not get enough iron in their diet. So if you fall into one category, one of those categories, it might be something to consider, or at least to consider getting a nutrition panel or an iron panel done. Um, if you fall into two of those categories, I would highly recommend it. And if you fall into three of those categories, um, run to the doctor and make sure you get your iron levels checked. Um, so B12 is another one, particularly if you're vegetarian or vegan that you're not getting a lot of in your diet. Um, and then when supplementing with B12, it's always good to supplement with folate. So irons or gnarly's iron blend has, has all three has iron B12 and folate. Um, so those are things like we call those at gnarly our baseline series where, um, they're really important for your baseline health. And that has, like a direct connection to, you know, whether or not you're, how many, you know, times you might get sick in a year, how long that sickness lasts, and that can um, impact your training and your recovery and how you feel as an athlete. So things like D, vitamin D and and um, iron and B12 are really important for athletes to consider um, as far as baseline health goes. Thank you for that. So back to the kind of in competition or in training fueling, I know there's different types of sugars, sucrose, fructose, dextrose. Can you maybe explain what athletes should consider when shopping for their fueling products? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've said this a a number of times, different, different strokes for different folks and, you know, different things work for different people. But I think for most 
Simple sugars are absorbed really easily and they can elevate our blood glucose really easily. Simply, uh, similar to our discussion with electrolytes, what you have to be worried about with simple sugars is when taking them in high concentration um, because they can have that same effect on water levels in our body. Because um, if we see a difference in the concentration of something within our gut versus in our body, then we're going to shunt water um, into our gut to try to dilute it. Um, and so making sure that you're not taking too much sugar all at once. I always recommend if people are using goose or something like that to follow it with some water um, is a really good idea uh, to make sure that we're diluting that concentration. Um, gnarly Fuel 2O contains two sugars. Um, it contains sucrose, which is a disaccharide, um, which is two simple sugars attached of um, fructose and glucose. And then it contains uh, glucose, or which is a, the same thing as dextrose. Um, and the reason why it contains those two sugars is because um, they're transported via different pathways or, or proteins in the gut. Um, and I always like to use an analogy uh, with traffic to explain why that matters. So, you know, if you have a bunch of traffic and all the cars are going through one tunnel, it's going to take everybody a little bit longer to get on the other side of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. But if there were two tunnels and you put all of the SUVs, you you know, all the SUVs go in one tunnel and all the cars go in the other tunnel, um, you could get total amount of cars through both tunnels faster because you're just moving more traffic. And, and there might also be, uh, you know, lower likelihood of, say, an accident um, because there's less of a bottleneck. What well, kind of works the same way in our gut. Um, often some of the, the gut issues that we get from consuming sugary substances can, can be because of that bottleneck, because we can't um, transport as much sugar as we want to into our bodies. Um, and so if you use sugars that capitalize on two different um, transport mechanisms or, or proteins to pass them into the body, then you're kind of reducing that bottleneck, bottleneck and getting more sugar absorbed than you would if you were just using one kind. And that, that theory is called multiple transportable carbohydrates. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, gnarly fuel 2 has sucrose and, um, and dextrose and why a lot of other, you know, similar products, you might see two different sugars because they're okay. kind of capitalizing in that. Makes sense. Idea. Another thing that just popped into my head, and I'm not sure this falls into your wheelhouse, so feel free to pass if it's appropriate, but it just started thinking about the microbiome and gut health as being something that a lot of athletes are talking about and thinking about. Is that something you're qualified to discuss? Um, I'm not super qualified, but definitely, yeah, I I, I know a little bit about it. And uh, Give us um, the quick 101 of what we should consider when it comes to our gut health. Yeah. So I think more and more research shows that consuming um, fiber in our diets is really important um, for promoting uh, a, a good, diverse microbiome and trying to get in as many different kinds of vegetables as possible. Um, and really the diversity of that microbiome has been kind of connected to overall health and um and in terms of digestive health and also in terms of kind of immune strength and immune health. So eat lots of different vegetables, eat the rainbow, um, and make sure you're getting enough fiber in, in your diet. I'd also say, um, you know, antibiotics, um, are often quick to be prescribed and we, um, have as a society benefited from antibiotics, but, um, I would, Make sure that when you do take them, you really need them. Make sure that you finish your entire course of antibiotics because um, we, when we see antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria evolve is when not all of the bad bacteria is actually killed, um, which mm. can often occur if you don't complete a course of antibiotics. And then you're, you're basically uh, promoting the growth of bacteria that's resistant to that antibiotic. And that's a, a really bad thing. And then um, try to increase the consumption, not even when you take antibiotics, of, but all the time of fermented foods. So of sauerkraut, of kimchi, um, of kombucha, if you like it, of yogurt, um, and just get a lot of good probiotics through your diet um, as often as you can. Thank you so much for that. Very interesting. I'd love to hear you talk about the NSF certification 
what does that mean and why has that become a core part of the gnarly philosophy and product line? Yeah. So um, I wanted to do to get gnarly products uh, NSF certified since I started at gnarly. So seven years ago, um, it's it can be somewhat costly, so it can be hard for small companies um, to kind of get on that path. But I'm, I'm really excited that we have now. Um, I think there's a lot of mistrust in the supplement industry, um, which, you know, I think there's some reason for that. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are FDA regulations that manufacturers and supplement companies should follow. And NSF certification is kind of an extra step that supplement companies can take, um, to really confer trust, um, in the product and in the brand to, uh, consumers. So NSF content certification, um, test products for label claims. So when you turn over and you look at nutrition contents or supplement content or nutrition facts or supplement facts, um, what is listed there is actually tested for. So, you know, in the case of vitamin D, if it says a thousand IUs, you know, they test that product to make sure that each capsule has a thousand IUs. Um, the product's also tested for contaminants. So microbes, heavy metals, and a full pesticide panel. And then on top of that, products that are NSF for sports certified are tested for all 300 substances on the World Anti-Doping Agency Banned Substances um, uh, list. So important for pro athletes, important for, you know, athletes that are tested regularly, but also really important for consumers that don't want any of that crap in the product they're taking. Um, so when you get a product that has an NSF mark on it, has the NSF for sport mark or other third party certifiers like USP or informed choice, you know, you're getting what you paid for and you know, you know, you're not getting other contaminants in there that could be bad for your health. Amazing. Shannon, I think this is probably the most educational and informal, informational uh, podcast I've ever done. And uh, I'm really grateful for your time coming on the show. Before we wind out, we got to do this again, by the way, because I have a million other questions. So we'll I would love to reschedule another one. But maybe before we go, any kind of like final thoughts or myths to boss or pet topics that you're passionate about that you want to elaborate on here at the end of the podcast? Yeah. I mean, I think it's important to note that just because. I work for a supplement company. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're a supplement pushers. Um, everyone at Gnarly is a big believer in whole foods first and supplements are just that they're supplemental. Um, it's important to realize that sometimes life can get in the way of our best nutritional intentions. And that's where having a brand you can trust can really help fill in those gaps and, and help you kind of achieve your athletic goals and, and that's simply, you know, what gnarly is there for to, to support people on, on their way, um, to their goals. Shannon O'Grady, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah. Thank you, Dylan.